Hi, and welcome to uh, EPT's documentation orientation. My name is Mike Jenko, and I'm one of the physicians with Emergency Physicians at Tidewater, and I'm joined by Tom Wagner. I'm the CFO for uh, EPT, and together Mike and I uh, play a role on the Finance Committee along with Moss Mendelssohn, EPT's president, and the three of us are the documentation experts for the group, and uh, we work very closely with our billing company to make sure that we're up to up to uh, date on all the latest documentation Absolutely. requirements. So this is the first in a multi-part series and it's going to be a series of modules that we hope to keep under five minutes in length for each piece so that you can do them at your leisure and uh, the goal is to get everybody that documents for EPT on the same page so that we're all reading from the same handbook trying to document the same way with the same general principles. Exactly. It's built from a series of lectures that we've been giving to incoming interns in emergency medicine, uh, oh golly, over at least the last four or five years. Right. And the feedback that we've gotten uh, is that it, the lecture is a very good lecture and it gives the residents a nice foundation from which to start their uh, careers. So, so for, yeah, for some of you, this is probably going to be a, a review. Uh, for others, some of this information may be new, but we're going to try to keep it simple, straightforward, and have it um, hopefully make some sense to you. And remember, this is how we encourage all of our providers to, to document, to follow some of these principles. And I think if you follow them, uh, in general, you will produce very good charts uh, that hopefully will you know, reimburse well, that will document uh, regulatory functions well, and will be you know, stand up on their own in a medical legal environment. Exactly. We're going to uh, sh share with you best practices that we have found over the years and uh, some pitfalls that we want you to avoid. And... Um, and so if you're not documenting to these standards, you will definitely get communications from us, uh, <laughs> or usually from me, yeah. <laughs> that will give you suggestions and uh, hopefully constructive criticism. Yes, yes. So first and foremost, again, in, the, in an effort to kind of keep this very basic and sort of take a 5,000 foot view, we wanted to talk about why we feel documentation is important and what roles the chart fills uh, when you document an encounter. And first and foremost, it fills a communication role. Um, you know, it's very important, I think, for uh, both you know, yourself, if you're reviewing a chart from an earlier date, or other providers who are taking care of a patient after you've uh, seen them, to understand what you were thinking and what the logic was behind why you did what you did during that encounter. Exactly. The, the uh, chart should tell a story, and it should tell it clearly so that everybody that looks at it, whether it's the next day or later the same day on an, inpa on an on a, uh, a admitted patient or six months later at a deposition, it should be a pretty clear story of exactly what happened in the emergency department. Absolutely. Then, of course, there's the medical legal role that the I chart just, fills. I just touched on that medical legal role, the deposition. So that might scare you, but, you know, you're going to see a lot of patients over your over your career. I think, Mike, what do you estimate? Something Between like, fifty and 60,000 wow, patients, maybe more. And you're not going to remember them all. Uh, you know, it, it's a fact that Tom sometimes doesn't remember patients he's seen earlier on the shift. Now that's a fact. So um, <laughs> That could be a reflection of his... Dementia? Yes, could that be, could yeah. be. So um, you're, the chart serves as a record of the encounter and so it is a legal document and there's a tenant that has been I'm sure you've heard before which is if you didn't document it you didn't do it but there's also a corollary to that tenant which is if you documented it you better have done it and what we mean is is that you don't wanna it's very easy with the electronic medical record mm -hmm. to inadvertently over document you may have a macro that you use for review of systems and if you use that on a patient but you didn't ask them all the questions yeah. that you have documented in your chart you're putting yourself at risk and one might even consider that fraud because you're documenting things that you didn't do or didn't ask yep. obviously there's a reimbursement aspect to how you document charts and that's something that's near and dear to Tom's heart uh, but everything that you put down in your chart is going to be coded by our uh, coders and then our uh, billing company is going to drop a bill uh, based on what you documented in that chart. And obviously if you forget something, uh, let's say that you did an IND and you forgot to document it, or let's say that the patient's admitted and you only put down eight review of systems, that's going to affect how that chart is uh, coded and how uh, we bill for that chart. And it's going to 
affect our uh, revenue and our reimbursement from that. So obviously that's very important and we want to get that get that correct. Right. The idea is that if you follow these best practices and these rules, which we're going to try to make very simple and straightforward, we should be getting paid appropriately for the work that you do, which is the which is the overarching goal. You want to have a clear record that documents what happened and you want to document in such a way that you can be paid appropriately for what you did. There are some rules that may not necessarily make sense to you and often these are driven by the government or by the third party payers and we'll try to make them clear uh, where those exist but again we're going to try to make it easy for you to document so that we can get paid appropriately. Absolutely. And then last but not least is the regulatory role that the chart fills. Um, you know, this is playing a bigger and bigger role in our uh, professional lives, uh, especially over the last five years, but with CMS, with state Medicaid, with Joint Commission, uh, with RAC audits, uh, all those, uh, all those uh, things need to be addressed and need to be served by the documentation in your chart. Yeah, and this is a rapidly changing area of documentation, and we'll try to communicate with you regular, regularly when uh, the climate changes or when the rules change. But, you know, uh, the government, even now, with specific disease processes, there are things that they want you to document so they can track them or make sure that, you know, that physicians are appropriately taking care of patients if they're getting paid by the government to do that. So um, that's an important role. And finally, just remember that the chart is a document that you don't know who is eventually going to look at it. So it could be the patient, could be other providers. So you want to make sure that you document appropriately so that whoever looks at that chart understands what you did. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the pitfalls with uh, maybe some inappropriate things that you would want to leave out of your chart if you could possibly do that. So hopefully that was a, uh, you know, a brief uh you know, enlightening introduction into kind of our general philosophy about the chart and, and what it does. Uh, in our next module, we're going to discuss some basic elements of the chart. And um, if uh, you have questions or comments or anything like that, uh, please contact myself or Tom and, and we'll try to address them. Right. Throughout the series, uh, if you come up with anything, just get in contact with us and we'll try to answer any of your questions.